Okay, so let's proceed with the second lecture. We're, we're, we're covering the mathematical sort of, I say, preliminaries, but as I said, there are new constructs and concepts that appear. And also we establish the notation and the way we um, sort of express some mathematical operations. So it's partially review, partially new stuff for you. So let me summarize what we did last time. We talked about the, uh, what we mean, and hopefully you read more about it in the lecture notes, um, what, 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 what a three-dimensional Euclidean vector space means. That's where we live, that's where we work. Okay, um, so then we introduce a basis in that vector space. If I take a vector, then I'd like to express that vector with respect to a basis. And the, uh, the basis essentially, in some sense, determines the um, dimension of the space because the maximum number of linearly independent vectors that you can put in a vector space is associated with the dimension of the space. So then if I pick any basis, for instance, vi, not necessarily orthonormal, that's how I would express that basis, that, that vector. Uh, but if I do pick an orthonormal basis set, then my notation was to use the uh, label of the vector itself, in this case, ai as the components, and uh, ei that denotes the orthonormal uh, basis set. And moreover, finally, we introduce the uh, summation convention, which gets rid of the summation sign. And we understand that there's a sum over i from 1 to the dimension of the space. Uh, that's a dummy index. It could be denoted as k, j, m, l, whatever. Uh, what's important is that it's repeated. And there are some rules. Uh, a index can be repeated at most twice um, and, or repeated at there can be only, it can appear only twice and indicate summation. If it appears three times, it's not allowed to indicate notation. That's sort of the convention that we take. Um, and um, we also talked about the inner product of the Euclidean vector space, which is a dot p or the um, simply a dot b. So that's how I'm going to express it from now on. A, i, b, i is the indication of that operation, the meaning of the operation. Um, with summation convention. Um, and we had essentially introduced yet another construct that would eventually be useful. That is delta ij, the Kronecker delta. Um, it is in terms of the orthonormal basis, ei dot ej. Okay, and that is pretty much where we were, apart from some side discussions. Um, now we'd like to proceed with um, a new concept, which is the um, vector product. Well, it's not a new concept, but we're going to establish the notation and the convention for this operation. And when we establish this or review this operation, I'm going to assume we are in 3D. And we will recall that usually you can choose a basis to be um, right-handed or left-handed. Okay, and our choice in the course is going to be our usual, well, the most common choice, the right-handed basis. So, well, what that essentially means is, or how that convention can be embedded into the classical a vector product, remember we also call it the cross product, is as follows. Okay, so um, EI vector product or cross product EJ, and I'm going to indicate that, or I'm going to define this operation as such. Now we know what the basis vectors are, but this is a new uh, construct that appears. We will call that the permutation symbol. The permutation symbol EIJK is essentially what uh, incorporates the sense of right-handedness. Um, and it's as follows. So it takes the value of 1 if 
um, the indices i, j, k are ordered. And by ordering, we now take to be the right-handed ordering. So for instance, 1, 2, 3 is a ordered triple of indices i, j, k. So the way we're going to think is that if we have the three possible values for i, j, k, if you rotate in the counterclockwise fashion, right? So that's the right-hand rule, like this. Then that's a plus one value for e, i, j, k. So for instance, one, two, three, or two, three, one, or three, one, two. Those are three possible values for i, j, k that give you eventually plus one by definition. Okay, so we say that if it is ordered, so that's one possible ordering that delivers plus one. Um, and also if we have even permutations of this ordering. So it's a fancy way of saying that if one, two, three gives you plus one, two, three, one, and three, one, two also gives you plus one. So for instance, um, so let me, let me first write this plus even permutations. In fact, let me quickly write down the values for other cases as well. So if ordered or even permutations of, the, of, the, of that triple, then it's a plus one. If you have odd permutations of that order, then it's a minus one, and it is zero otherwise. Okay. So those are the possibilities. So if you look here for a second, so right, one, two, three, plus even permutation. So I'm going to take two numbers and switch their positions. That's one permutation, but that would be a one permutation, so it's an odd. So I want to do it twice to have even permutation. So for instance, I switch two, one, and then I switch one, three. So it becomes two, three, one. So that would be a switch in places twice. And I can do it um, once more. So for instance, I can switch three and two, and then I can switch the one and two, so it would be a three and one and two. That's another even permutation. That's the only possible three even permutations I can have of this triple, right? So you have one, two, three, two, three, one, and three, one, two. That's the right-hand rule. So if you have an odd permutation, okay? So odd permutation, you switch only once. Right, so for instance, two, one, three, okay? So that means you go two, one, three in the clockwise direction, so that would be a minus one. So diagrammatically, this explains everything, but this just puts things in worse words. And uh, zero otherwise means, for instance, okay, anything else. So anything else by the, through these possibilities uh, requires essentially that something is repeated. So for instance, one, one, three, okay? Otherwise falls, or this falls into that category. One, one, three, or one, 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 two, 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 one, two. Anything that involves a repeated index, that gives you a zero, okay? And then what you can eventually conclude from this is that if you have a basis, where you have, for instance, let me draw with blue. Let's say you have E1, you have E2, and you have E3. If you now you make use of this definition, notice that we have a dummy index, so there's a sum over k, okay? But if k is equal to any of the values of i, j, k, then it's a zero. So the way we interpret this expression is, i and j are free indices, they intrinsically have some value. I could have called them m and l, whatever. It doesn't change the meaning of that expression, but k is a dummy index, it's a repeated index. Uh, it could be called something else that doesn't match the free indices, but what's important is there is a sum. So if k, the dummy index, as you sum over it, if it matches any of the values of i or j, the value drops completely this, that, that portion of the sum due to that part, okay? Um, so, so if you use that definition in here, okay, so you will see that E1 cross E2 gives you 
E3. Again, that's the right hand rule. Or E2 cross E3 will give you E1. Okay? Or E1 cross E3 will give you minus E2. So all of that is embedded in that compact expression. That's, why the per that's what the permutation symbol serves in a compact fashion. Um, now, so the concept of ordering, right? This ordering and um, following that ordering by even or odd permutations does not require really that we assign some values, values to these indices. It works with or without explicit numbers attached to those indices. So what I mean is the following. So let me make a note here. So if I have E, I, J, K, okay? So what we understand, again, now in this case, there is no repetition of anything. I just have three indices. So implicitly, I understand that there is some value attached to those indices. Um, so the values might be repeated or not. But eventually, it works out whether they're repeated or not. So they could be 1, 2, 3, or 2, 1, 3, or they could be 1, 1, 2. It doesn't matter. So what the rules tell me is that if I take the value, and if I do one permutation on it, that's an odd permutation. Okay? If I do one permutation, if it is plus 1, it will become minus 1. If I do 2, or, or vice versa, if it were minus 1, right? So 2, 1, 3 is minus 1. If I do one permutation on a minus 1 setting, then that will deliver me 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, which is now plus 1. So if it's plus 1, it becomes minus 1. If it's minus 1, it becomes plus 1. So E, I, J, K is equal to minus E, J, I, K. If you take any one of the two indices, two pairs, and you switch them, you get a minus sign. It doesn't matter whether I have numbers attached to those indices. It works anyway. Um, or I could have switched j and k. So it's equal to minus e i k j. Okay? Um, now, if you go ahead and do one more permutation on that. So for instance, I switch i and k. You get another minus sign. So it again becomes a plus e j k i. And likewise here, I can do one more, one more permutation right here. So it would be a plus E, K, I, J. Right? If any of the indices were repeated, so for instance, if I had 1, 1, 2, this is again 1, 1, 2. E, 1, 1, 2 is minus E, 1, 1, 2. That's the, the only way that can happen is if E, 1, 1, 2 is equal to 0, but that's how it is. That's by definition defined to be 0 anyway. So, uh, whether or not uh, you start with an ordered or a uh, non-ordered triple um, or any repeated in the indices are involved, this observation holds. And we're going to make use of this type of a observation very soon for any i, j, k. Okay. So in fact, let us immediately make use of this um, compact expression for the cross product to actually go ahead and derive the expression for the cross product of two arbitrary vectors. So um, I'll do this uh, for you at this stage. And then. Well, maybe the next one I will also do, but then soon you will get a chance to play around with these uh, symbols once again as a small exercise. Um, so A cross B. Now, the way we're going to always approach these, um, these types of expressions to find out an explicit representation of that expression in terms of the indices, I will plug in the individual expressions for A and B in terms of an orthonormal basis set. Why in terms of an orthonormal basis set? Because again, orthonormal basis set is convenient and also it allows me to express things in this sort of compact fashion. Okay, perhaps it's at this stage it's a good idea to go back and remind you one convenience. So for instance, if I'm in an orthonormal basis set and if I would like to calculate AI, what I do is I simply take the dot product of A with the basis set member EI. If it's not an orthonormal basis set, uh, 
So if it were v, this thing, this does not give me alpha i. That's what we discussed last time. So it requires, this simple expression requires that I have an orthonormal basis set. So it carries over all to, to all of these definitions as well. So once you have an orthonormal basis set, things become more compact. So in the context of an orthonormal basis set, in terms of the components, how does this operation look? Now that's my goal. So I plug in the expressions for A and B explicitly, right? And then, so I have EAI, BJ, EI cross EJ, okay? So why don't you not write and just have a look for a second. Um, then I invoke the definition for EI cross EJ, which is simply EI, J, K, E, K. And hence, I have AI, BJ, EI, J, K, E, K. Okay? Now, none of this is stuff that you need to memorize. You should be able to always go ahead and drive it. And hence, you should sort of learn this part. This is because that's a definition. But everything else is to be, um, to, be, to, to be derived when necessary. But it's, of course, nice to remember. So now A cross B, it's a new vector C. And C, with respect to an orthonormal, the same orthonormal basis, would have an expression C, K, E, K. And therefore, we recognize this part of the expression to be the component C, K, right? So if I'd like to calculate CK, I go ahead and say, oh, E, I, J, K, the last index is the free index, and I, J is summed over, okay? Uh, that's not the only way to express a cross product, so the ordering can be slightly different. So let me rewrite this um, once again so that I can carry out some permutation. So what I can do is, first, I can um, do one permutation here. So E, I, K, J, right? I switch J and K. I have to put a minus sign. And then if I switch once more K and I, then I have to put another minus sign. It becomes a plus E, K, I, J. So this is equivalently equal to E, K, I, J, A, I, B, J, E, K, okay? So now this is also C, K. So these are two slightly expression. In one day, the index K appears first, and then there are the sum indices. In one case, the free index appears last, and then there's a sum over the um, free indices, okay? It's just sometimes one memorize or with repeated use, one sort of sinks in, and there's a preference over uh, which one sinks in, depending on the person, I suppose. I think this one I tend to use more, but just remember that the expression is not unique. There can be very slight changes, but of course, numerically, they are all equivalent. OK, so uh, I'd like to do another exercise. And this exercise is nice because it's perhaps the first sort of uh, uh, exercise where there are a lot of repeating indices. And you have to be careful with how you choose the indices. And I'd like to ch choose or show, actually, sorry, something very simple. Namely, if you take the dot product of a vector with the same vector cross with some other vector, it's equal to It's equal to 0, because this is perpendicular eventually going to, to both a and b. And so the dot product of that vector with one of those vectors. So for that matter, if I put b here as well, it's again equal to 0. And that's my 0 vector. So that's what I like to show. So it's like a tiny proof. Um, and again, the way I proceed with the problem is to explicitly plug in the expressions for all of these vectors. So again, why don't you take a short break? Because usually, you will have some time to complete. Have a look, and then make sure you can follow. Um, so 
I'm going to plug in these expressions, right? Um, and I choose the indices almost arbitrarily, okay? Uh, what I should be careful about at this stage is that none of the indices should be repeated more than twice to indicate summation, right? So for every vector, I need to have some summation involved, right? So once I use L, here I shouldn't use L anymore. So I'm going to choose something else. Let me follow my notes just in, um, well. I don't like my choice there. I'm going to pick something else. So I'm going to pick, let's pick I and J, why not? Okay, so uh, then I look at that expression and what I see here is A i, B j, E i cross E j. And this is where I apply the definition of the cross product. Sorry, right here, E i cross E j, E i j k, E k. So E i j k, E k. Um, now, let me go ahead and now write this explicitly. So I have an AL, AI, BJ, EI, JK, and EL dot EK. Okay? Warn me if I do a mistake with the indices because it's possible, right? A lot of indices are floating around. Now, then I notice this to be the Kronecker delta. Now, the indices, in fact, in this case, both indices of the Kronecker delta, they're repeated. So I can choose one and decide to invoke the substitution property. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I see that L appears here and there. So I'm going to get rid of this Kronecker delta, and instead of here, I'm going to plug K. So that is the substitution property, okay? So therefore, what I have here now is um, A, I, B, J, A, K. Let me just order everything nicely. E, I, J, K, okay? Are we good so far? Okay, so. So now what I will do is a uh, small trick, hopefully, and let's see how that is going to work out. Um, so I remember this expression. I'm now going to play around with it. Let me pick a different color. So, so this already is correct, but now I'd like to show that it's equal to zero. So now the ensuing parts is sort of how I see the problem immediately at this point stage because I'm not looking at my notes, right? So I'm going to, I, I have a goal and I'm going to try to walk towards it. I'm going to play with a permutation on the permutation simple, so I'm going to switch the indices. So this is equal to minus E I K J, okay? I switch J and K. And then I can do, um, I can do one more switch. So I'm going to say E, K, I, J, okay? One more switch, and I'm, I'm going to invoke one more switch. So that's equal to minus E, K, J, I, all right? No tricks, okay. So now, Remember that all of these indices are repeated indices, so it doesn't matter what I call them. I chose to call the first one a i, j, a, k, right? Uh, but I could have chosen any other um, expression for them. Now, the first thing I will do is, before, after reminding you that, I'm going to simply take this a i, put it to that side, and put that A to the other side. So I'm going to write exactly the same thing. A, K, I just switched the positions, that's all. B, J, A, I. And then I have E, K, J, I with a minus sign, 
I haven't done anything, right? So now, these are dummy, right? So I could have called them M, N, M, N. Do we agree? Well, I could have called them I, K, I, K. Do we agree? So I've sort of switched I and K, but what I'm really doing is I'm pulling off the labels, switching the labels. It doesn't matter what the labels are. What's important is that there is a summation over those labels. Okay? So if it confuses you that I directly switch I and K, you can think that I first relabeled them to M and N, and then I relabel them again to I and K. It happens that I and K is switching K, I, but whatever. OK, so then I have A, I, B, J, A, K, E, I, J, K. OK? And that's the proof. Why? Because this is A, I, B, J, A, K, E, I, J, K. It is some number x, okay? And this is exactly the same thing with a minus sign. So it's equal to minus x. And the only way that can happen is if x is equal to 0, okay? So that's a little exercise for you. So the goal here was twofold. One, to show that, but really the major goal was to sort of practice with these concepts, with the labels, with the switching when necessary, etc. Okay? This is something that we will routinely do. And I do admit, sometimes you get lost in your choice of the indices, but with practice, uh, the situation improves. It's not always entirely eliminated, but uh, it certainly improves. It's a good time to ask questions if you have any while I open a window. Just about the, all the calculation on the right-hand side. Any question here? Yeah. Uh, would there be any difference if we contracted K instead of L when we introduced the uh, delta? Um, OK. So fair question. So I have IJ, IJ. K is the index eventually that I end up repeating, right? And it has to do with this one, right? If you had contracted instead of K, if you had went and realized that K is repeated there, and so you can go ahead and plug in delta L, sorry, instead of, so I'm going to write over, I hope, so you can just omit the blue one, okay? So, um, as you write, but now think that I had written over that and didn't have that, right? So then I would have A, L, sorry, right, A, L, A, I, B, J, E, I, J, L, that's it, right? So instead of K appearing, I would have L appearing. And just like you said now, it's a dumb index, so I can always relabel it to K if you like, to make them identical. But really, I don't need to do relabeling to make them identical. So numerically, they are identical, okay? So it doesn't matter how you choose to substitute. It's not a, let me say, proof-changing or life-changing decision uh, to make it more serious. It's, it's, you end up always with the same thing. Any other question? Uh -huh. What happens if we cross over from, like, let's say, the first and the third? Is it the same thing? Um, uh, it's not the same thing. And you see that here. If you cross over some, two indices that have a distance between them, like this, that's equivalent to these intermediate operations being taken. And hence, you have actually a minus sign kicking in in that case. So the permutation always has to do with neighboring indices. Yeah. yeah, right. That's actually a good question. Perhaps that I did not say that explicitly when I was defining the permutation symbol. So when you permute, it always, it's always with uh, neighboring indices. Yeah. Uh, 
OK. So now, um, so step by step, right, we are building in a logical order all the concepts that we need. So once we define the cross product, now we can go ahead and define something else that's going to be useful, and it is the triple product. The triple product itself is not going to, it's not something we're going to use a lot, but we're, we will use it to define some quantities that we eventually will end up using quite a lot. Um, at these, or they are very important. So the triple product is nothing but a definition. It's just a new way to indicate this operation. <coughs> and that's the order, right? The first one dots the cross of the remaining two. Okay? Um, and eventually, if you play around with this expression, you will see that the triple product behaves like, right? I'm going to say like because it's not equal to E, A, B, C. But if you were to think of the vectors, you take their labels and think of them as being indices, right? Uh, and now what we know is that if I switch, if I do even permutation, it retains its value. Odd permutations, you get a minus sign. So you can apply the same concept here as well. So the triple product behaves like EABC with respect to change of order. So for instance, um, triple product ABC. Now you can go ahead and switch A and B. So it's like switching A and B here. I have to have a minus sign. Okay, And you can do one more switch of A and C then the minus sign is repeated, so you get a plus B, C, A, et cetera. Okay? So it behaves like the permutation symbol. And I do see that in some way, at least in one specific case. For instance, if I choose the two indices to be the same, so for instance, A dot A cross C, it's zero. Okay? So it does behave like this because A, A, C, that's a repeated index, and it should be uh, 0 if there is no sum. Uh, well, even if there is a sum over it. OK. Um, so this definition incorporates in itself a result, namely that A B, C, triple product is equal to 0 is equivalent to saying intrinsically that these three vectors are linearly independent. Okay? Linearly, sorry, dependent. Um, that's something for yourself to think about. Uh, but I can give you a case where the reverse is true. So in other words, if it's not equal to 0, they are linearly independent. That's very easy to see. Um, just one example. For instance, if I pick this to be E1, E2, E3. These are my basis vectors. I know by choice that they are linearly uh, independent. And that's. E, I, that's actually 1 in this case. E, 1, 2, 3, well, let me just write 1, plus 1. Okay, so it's not equal to 0. So a linearly independent uh, set of three vectors does not deliver you 0. If they are linearly dependent, they will deliver you uh, 0. Okay? Um, this, again, is going to appear very soon. Or in fact, we're going to make use of the fact that if we choose three vectors that are linearly independent, it is not equal to 0. We're going to make use of that fact. I will just remind you when the time comes.
Um, so now what we've done so far is we've defined some basic operations and symbols. Now we're going to go towards a construct that is um, practically familiar to you, but in terms of a rigorous, let me say, uh, mathematical definition, it is new. Okay. And that concept is a tensor. So let me proceed with now tensor algebra. So, so far we worked with vectors, so now we move on to tensors. Now I will define first a operator um, and I will indicate my operators with a capital letter and just like for vectors, I like to put a line underneath them to indicate that they are not scalars, but they are something else, okay? The way, we are, the way we've developed our thinking now, this always indicated a vector, but now whenever I write a capital letter, except in a few situations, it's going to indicate an operator, okay? And a operator is something that uniquely maps a vector from our three or let's say n-dimensional um, vector space to another vector in the vector space. Okay. Now it can do that in a number of ways. I'm going to indicate this operation as such, okay? Uh, because I have an underlying motivation for introducing this operator. In fact, I already have in my mind some additional properties that I would like to attach to this operator. And hence, the way I've expressed this, uh, this, this, this map from one vector to another through the operator A is as though this is a matrix and this is some ordinary vector from your uh, linear algebra and now this is another vector. So a matrix vector product, it gives you another vector, right? And that, just think that way actually. That's how it's going to be eventually, right? But I'm being a little bit more, more general uh, presently uh, by putting those lines un underneath and there's a reason for that. Now moreover, um, your intrinsic idea of um, a matrix vector product is already linear, but in general, it doesn't have to be so. For the operator to be linear, it needs to satisfy a pair of conditions. And so that's the linearity condition, and it comes in two parts. And it has to do with how it acts on a scalar multiple of a vector. So if instead of A, you plug in scalar multiple of that vector, the result is equal to the scalar multiple multiplying the operation on the vector itself. Okay? And the second part entails how it acts on the sum of two vectors. So the operation on the sum of two vectors is equal to the sum of the operations on individual vectors. So if the operator satisfies this, then the operator is linear, okay? So matrix vector product is, in fact, linear, okay. Isn't the second condition common to the first condition? Like a plus a. Um, but what if it's not a plus a? A plus, so if you choose B to be A, that's a specific choice, right? Yeah, I, what I'm saying is, do we really need the first condition if it's satisfying the second condition? Does it automatically satisfy the first condition? That's a good question. <laughs> I think if B is a multiple of A, then yes. Like if I can prove the second part, do I need to prove the well, the thing is you don't prove them. That's the one first thing. You, this is the definition, okay? So you take this to be true, okay? So now the question is, if this is true, do I need this as a separate condition? It's a fair question. So if I pick B to be A, or an arbitrary multiple of A, then I can generate alpha. You're right. 
Oh, I got it. All right. Uh, it's, it's, it's not in there, right? Or is it? It's not in there. So uh, I, I may not be able to be go one step ahead. But let, let, me, let me give you an example. So if this is 2a, right? And hence, I have 2a. So I want to conclude that this is equal to 3 times AA. But how do I take this 2 outside? You need to have conditions. Right? Uh, I see. Write it like A, a plus, plus a. a plus A. I can always divide. The, because I know the vector can be divided into A plus A. But you can't take the common factor because you don't know it. But then that's going to be a third one, no? So I don't see the pitfall. I don't see the pitfall, but this is one immediate counterexample. How do I take I two outside? Here, instead of B, I can write A plus A, right? Because we said let B equals 2A. And I know that that is equal to 8 plus A. Because that has to be true for vectors. And B is a vector. OK. If I put minus A. So now we're moving beyond, sort of at this stage, exactly. We are moving behind the purpose of me defining these. But, but, but we're not trying to prove anything. And the people watching, hopefully, do not take us for mathematicians. But, but so if, if it's a minus sign, right, then it's a minus a. So now how do you conclude that I can take, for instance, can I take minus outside? I don't know. So. To know if I can take the minus outside, this would certainly help. Okay? Now, I don't know if there's a pitfall here. It was a very good question. But I tried to at least generate some um, counter example. I don't know if it does actually serve as a counter example, but it seems to. OK? OK, so uh, now let us say that we do have a linear operator. And now, Remember, eventually I'd like to end up with the usual, or I would like to end up with uh, the usual matrix vector multiplication. And there are some additional rules that we typically follow. And these rules are also sort of, uh, let me say, defined to help us understand how to work with these operators, with, these, with a linear operator. Um, so let's combine these two rules with with how it acts on scalars and other linear operators. Um, so the operator is already linear if it satisfies 1 and 2, I'm just continuing the numbering, sort of to keep track of the, let me say, definitions involved. So there's going to be a distributivity, associativity, and there, there are two parts to it. There's a part 1, and there is a part 2. Um, so distributivity tells you, so now we would like to put in more than 1. Uh, operator essentially and try to understand how I can combine their influence on the vector. So if you have a operator that is the sum of two, then you can conclude the result by actually calculating the individual influence on the influences on the vectors and then sum, summing up the results. Uh, so that's distributivity. If you have a the product of two operators operating on a vector, then what you can do is you can first make B operate on A, and then that's a vector itself by definition of the operator. And now, then you can act with this on that vector. OK. And finally, if you have a scalar multiple of the operator, then you can first act on the vector and take a scalar multiple. 
Um, so now, so far, actually, we have an operator. You can, you can think of a function as well. You can think of as f as some, that, like, f of x equals y. Not every function is linear, OK? Uh, but there are linear functions, like 3 times x is equal to y, x, y is equal to, that's a linear function, right? Uh, so not every operation is linear. If it satisfies these, these are linear. And then we also endow this operator to satisfy some additional or we understand this is how it acts on vectors and combinations of operators and on somehow scalars involved, different vectors involved. So now we understand how this process works. But even when I come to this stage, it's not necessarily that I have a matrix vector multiplication. This could be some exotic framework where I still actually have some functions involved that you are not used to. But as I said, in this course, whenever I write this, you understand the vector as we understand it usually. And this eventually has to do with a matrix. So from all of these, I understand or always see matrices, matrices multiplying vectors somehow. But really, I just wanted to put a footnote here and say that at this stage, really, I don't have to have matrices and vectors involved. It could be more general than that. It could be a lot different than that. So, but now that in our mind, eventually the goal is to have something to do with the vectors as we know it, physical vectors. Um, I would like to attach a special name to this linear operator. And I'm going to call it a tensor. And in fact, um, I'm going to now flex the. So this is where things sometimes get terminology-wise a little bit um, foggy. And I'll tell you why. So I'm going to, whenever I write a, except for a few cases that will be very clear when the time comes, except for those few cases, a capital letter with a line underneath, that's going to be a tensor that is going to be of second order. Where does the two come from? Eventually think that this has to, will have to do with a matrix. A matrix has two indices, and that's where the second order comes from. A vector, on the other hand, has only one index, right? So. In some sense, if you change the number of indices, you have a control over the order of the tensor, right? And in that sense, in that sort of slightly flexed sense, uh, a vector is a first order tensor. That's a definition or a expression that you will uh, also sometimes see, okay? There are various reasons why one might object to that generalization. And I will not use it a lot, actually. Okay, but if you think of the number of indices eventually, this certainly makes sense. So I could have really a third order tensor, fourth order tensor, et cetera. I'll give you at least a one or two examples uh, shortly. Uh, now, at this stage, what one might also remember is that uh, is something I said, and this is again a footnote something I said before. So uh, we're talking about vectors, OK? And I told you that actually when you talk about the vector space, it could be something very general. It doesn't have to do necessarily with vectors that we are accustomed to, like physical vectors like velocity. It could involve like functions. Function spaces uh, uh, could, could qualify eventually as a vector space. And eventually, therefore, vector is something, a vector space is something very general. So in fact, if you carefully construct or think about the properties involved in the definition of a vector space, uh, sets of matrices okay, could qualify as a vector space. Okay? So matrices could qualify, sorry, set of matrices could qualify as a vector space. So now you're saying that, when I say these, it's like I'm saying vector space is more general than a matrix. So more general than a tensor, 
right? So vector is more general than a tensor would be another way to put the expression. But here I'm saying exactly the reverse. I'm saying that I have a tensor. A second order tensor is one case. A first order tensor is a special case. A vector is a special case of a tensor, OK? So the sort of the funny statements, like sort, of, sort of entangled statements, arise from the fact that our understanding of a vector is very specific. It's a physical vector, position vector, velocity vector, etc. And within that limited understanding, our vector is, if you like, a first order tensor. But I'm not going to say that often. I'm just going to say a vector. So when I say a vector, imagine always a single index. Okay? And when I say a tensor, it's going to be at least two indices usually. Okay? More often than not, we will have only two indices. Sometimes we will have more. Okay? And when the time comes, you will see uh, what types of uh, tensors have more than one more than two index, OK? But what are examples to second order tensors? For instance, physically, uh, we're going to give examples in the special uh, topics as well as before the special topics arrive. Uh, for instance, uh, the stress is a tensor. Strain is a tensor. Those are very two important examples to tensors. Okay. Um, all right. So there was a question. Uh, could we say yes? If you like. Yes. There is no index, so it sort of makes sense. Yeah. OK, so just for the purpose of introducing um, the notation, I'm going to, I think, um, squeeze in right here, perhaps here, um, two more tensors. Again, I'm Continuing with the enumeration, um, just for completeness purposes, if you like, they are separate, in fact, definitions for notation alone. I will have an identity tensor. I will denote it with an I. Okay? Please make sure you always use, by the way, these underlines for vectors and as well as for your tensors. Always put the line underneath. If there is no line underneath, I understand the scalar always. Okay, so it's important you put the line. So an identity tensor I is such that when you operate on a vector, you get itself. Okay, and we will have also the zero tensor. And just like for a vector, I'm going to indicate it with a capital zero. Okay. So in this case, the zero tensor acts on a vector. It gives you the zero vector. The vector and the tensor look the same, but um, the zero tensor itself is not going to appear very often, so it's OK. And if you um, add the zero tensor to another non-zero tensor, you get the non-zero tensor itself. All right. OK, so now the next thing I will introduce is a tensor product. Um, we have tensors. We have indications of how they work on vectors. Um, so we understand something about them, but we don't know what they look like. So a tensor product will help us construct what they look like. So for this purpose, let me just first take two vectors. The first one, let's say EI, AI. The first, the second one is B, BJ, EJ. Um, now, the vector is not only the set of its components, right? Because I remember from last time that the components depend on the basis that I choose. If I look, choose a different basis, the components will change. So if I go ahead and put the components of the vector in an array, okay, a1, a2, etc., and so that's my array. I cannot call this the vector A. Okay. 
this only involves the components of the vector A with respect to a certain basis EI. Without knowing what the basis is, I cannot construct the vector. So I have some components, but what are the directions associated with those components? I have no idea. So, all right. So I need to know what the basis is always to construct the vector. So when I say a vector, I'm referring to the set of the components with respect to a basis. Okay? Uh, and therefore, when I take the components and put them into a ordered, right? Uh, let me say um, uh, an order like this, I don't want to at this stage, at this particular stage, call it a vector. That's what perhaps what you used to call it in uh, like some math courses. But for me, this is an array. It's just an array of numbers. Because a vector has to do with a components with respect to a given basis. And I don't see the basis here, and so I don't want to call it a vector. OK, so that's an array of the components of the vector A. And likewise, I can go ahead and put the components of the vector B into an array. Okay. Again, this is not the vector B. It's just the components with respect to A basis. Okay. I know what the basis is, but unless I somehow attach it explicitly, as in the summation convention, I cannot say that the resulting quantity is a vector. Okay. This is a vector. This is not a vector. It's an array. Um, so then, nevertheless, let me just sort of remind you your classical set of operations that involve such arrays. Uh, if I take A transpose B, right? A transpose B is going to multiply. At this stage, I haven't even defined what the transpose is. But of course, you remember it from your linear algebra classes. So the result is A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, A3 B3, etc. right? Um, and in terms of the summation convention, that's nothing but a i b i. And now I know that a i b i, in terms of a vector notation, is a dot b. Okay. So what I've done, so I have a purpose here. I'm trying to make a link between your classical linear algebra notation to what it indicates in terms of vector notation, or in general, tensor notation, a dot b. OK, so now instead of this a transpose b, how about if I try to calculate a b transpose? What would I get then? A I would get a matrix, right? So these are arrays. a b transpose would give me a matrix. It's sort of like a special array, but it has more than one dimension. In this case, it will have two dimensions. And it will be a1, b1, a1, b2, etc. Here I would have a2, b1, a3, b1, etc. Right? And therefore, this is some matrix A, where a i j is equal to a i b j. Um, so now, right, they look very similar, but there is a drastic difference between what they mean. Now, if I now walk back, I say, well, OK, I have a result. Um, it, the, ex the operation gives you this result. It, it's equal to the dotted two vectors. And I know what I mean by a vector. It's more than the set of its components. It has to do also with this basis. Uh, so now, A, I, B, I are the components. But the basis sort of uh, is eliminated through the meaning of the um, inner product, the scalar product, together with the fact that I have an orthonormal basis. So they cancel out. Only the components remain, right? So now these are the components of the vector. Now here I also have the components of the vector, right? It's not a repeated index, okay? So they are free indices. I ask myself the reasonable question, well, this result is somehow associated with some vectors and some possible operation between them. Can I associate this result also with vectors A and B? 
In order to do that, if I want to associate them with the vectors a and b, the basis somehow must appear in there. And so far, I'm only seeing the components. And they're free components. They are not repeated, so there is no sum over them. So where is the basis? And what happens, or how can I introduce a basis? And the definition of a tensor product serves that purpose of sort of answering that question uh, implicitly. So we are going to introduce a particular type of a second order, if you like. At this stage, it goes without saying. Presently, everything is second order, which is going to look like this, A tensor product B. Okay. So this notation, let me write it once again. I didn't, it wasn't clear enough. So it's a cross with a circle around it. It's called a tensor or a dyadic product versus a scalar or a dot, dot product. Um, and sometimes one, I will simply read it as bun. Okay. I will say A bun B instead of saying A tensor product or A dyadic B. Okay. Uh, so A bun B is a second order tensor composed of two vectors. So now that's just the definition. So let us go ahead and see what it looks like in terms of components. Um, so I'm going to plug in the expressions for A and B. Okay, and that's equal to AI BJ. AI bun EJ. And now what I'm seeing is that there is a now what I define to be a tensor, and I define it to be a particular type of tensor. Okay. A bun B. Okay, it's just a definition. Okay. And um, this is the way that components, or in terms of components of the vectors, that's how that particular tensor looks. So these are the components of that tensor. And now I understand, right? if you look here, I understand A, I, B, J, so this thing, which constitutes a matrix, to be composed of the components of a very particular type of tensor. Okay. But now what I also notice is that there is a basis. And these components refer to a very particular basis. And just like for a vector, if I were to choose different initial basis vectors to construct this basis for a second order tensor, then the components would eventually change. So these are the components with respect to this particular basis. The basis changes, the components will change. And that's what differentiates a tensor from a matrix. Just like the basis differentiates a vector from an array, right? A vector is more than an array. It's more than the set of its components. You have to attach to it the basis. In the same fashion, a tensor is more than the matrix that constitutes its components. Together with the basis that you attach those components to, you get the tensor itself. And this is a very particular type of tensor. Um, now, let us proceed. So at this stage, perhaps things are a little bit vague. Uh, you are at one end. On one, on one hand, uh, you are familiar with these uh, concepts because they look like things you already know about, like matrices. But on the other hand, I introduced this funny notation. And uh, you are perhaps asking yourself, why do we need that at all? Well, you will see as we go take further steps. Um, so now, remember that a 
this is a linear operator, a tensor that eventually acts on vectors. So I need to understand how such a tensor acts on a um, vector. That is very important. in order to apply it in a practical setting. So, operation on a vector is defined now as follows. Okay, so that's a definition. It's not something I can uh, prove. And that's my definition. Okay, A bond B operating, so that's a tensor operating on a vector is such that so you can actually now memorize the rule as follows, and because this is something you do have to understand and use repeatedly, if you have A bond B operating on a vector, the rule is that you take the neighboring vectors, dot them, and you leave the first one free. Okay, B dot C equals A. Um, so now I know how it also operates, and which will eventually allow me to uh, multiply an arbitrary tensor with an arbitrary vector, but how does an arbitrary tensor look? It looks as follows. So an arbitrary tensor, second order tensor has components A, I, J, and a basis E, I, bond E, J. Um, similarly, right, um, you can write a, well, actually, actually, first let me make a remark because we're running out of time. Um, so I said that this is a, in general, a arbitrary second order tensor. Now we'd like to compare that with this expression. This is a very particular type of second order tensor where the components a, i, j correspond to products of the components of two vectors. This, in general, doesn't need to hold. In other words, not every a, i, j is the sum of a small a, i times a b, j. Okay? That's not necessary. So in general, these are arbitrary choices of numbers that constitute a matrix. Okay? So um, at this stage, so next time when I start, I'm going to review all of the stuff, and perhaps at some of the things are abstract. I'll give you examples as to how this basis looks, and perhaps examples to AI BJ versus a general AIJ, et cetera. But I'll also then give you just a quick few examples on how you could construct tensors of higher order, like a third order, a fourth order, et cetera. Okay, so, um, and afterwards, we will have sufficient, let me say, tools in our hands to quickly move towards uh, quantities that will help us construct basic continuum mechanics concepts. Okay, so we're actually in good shape, and uh, let's stop here and continue on Thursday. Thank you. <laughs>